I've pre-opened. I've pre-opened my little cup this time. After the fiasco last time, it was hot and my hands were slipping and, and everything else. I can tie fishing flies, I can play the piano, but open one of these cups and I'm stumped. Um, anyway, um, let's turn then to uh, Psalm 87. Psalm 87. You know, recently I've started uh, reading, a, a, I suppose, a fairly hefty biography of, of uh, the composer um, J.S. Bach. Uh, it's a, called Music in the Castle of, of Heaven, and uh, it's a pretty substantial biography, although fairly, fairly academic, so uh, I'm not suggesting you should rush out and buy a copy. Uh, it's, it's quite an academic um, biography. And J.S. Bach uh, was a, a real Christian, and the author, um, a conductor, uh, John Elliott Gardner, he, in the book, he, he shows that the real influence upon J.R. Spark and the, pol the whole of, actually, um, the dynasty, because you're probably one of the most musical uh, dynasties uh, that there have been, uh, about you know, four generations or more of musicians, of, of noted musicians and composers. And... Uh, but the author shows how the real influence upon certainly J. S. Spark and, and numbers of the fa in the family actually was was the gospel. In fact, it was the influence of Martin Luther. Uh, you know, they were German Lutherans, and J. S. Spark was a real believer, and and actually uh, the, the the big influence upon his music. Um, the reason why he was so prolific, and the reason why he signed every piece of music "Soli Deo Gloria," was because he was a uh, because of the gospel, was because he'd come to know the Lord Jesus. And, and the, it was interesting that the, the author, who is not himself uh, clearly a, a believer, it's interesting that, that he points out that, that that's the influence that the gospel always has. Christianity leads to music. It leads to singing, to great, to great music and to great singing. Um, it was actually Martin Luther... Um, rather than uh, Cliff Richard, actually, who, who famously said, why should the devil have all the best tunes? Um, which I know was coined by uh, Cliff Richard, but, but it, was, it was actually um, Luther, Martin Luther, who said that. And, and I think Martin Luther is absolutely right, isn't he? Um, that uh, when we become Christians, we want to sing. Um, and uh, Christians, as I mentioned this morning, Christians take to singing in much the same way that ducks take to water. And, and that's why this pandemic has just been so frustrating for us, or at least one of the reasons why it's been so frustrating for us. And we understand the need uh, for, for masks and everything else, but, but it's one of, been one of the frustrations. But God's people have always loved to sing God's praises, so that thankfully, you know, we have a rich heritage of, of hymnody and of, of songs. Um, you know, it, it's, I remember somebody once saying to me, uh, somebody once said to me, but he said, the trouble is all the hymn, the songs that we sing, he said, they, he said they're for some of them from the 1990s. Um, well, I didn't quite know whether to laugh or cry at that point, uh, because we stand in a tradition that goes back centuries, centuries back to the early church. You know, we, 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 we stand in a procession and we joyfully sing words that have been written by Augustine. Uh, and and uh, in fact, going back prior to that, actually going back to, well, 1500 years, really, if you think about uh, the Song of Moses, um, you know, going back rather 1500 BC, if you're thinking about Moses and Psalm 90. But, but it goes all the way back to the book of Psalms, doesn't it? Um, the book of Psalms was Israel's hymn book. In fact, it's still actually our hymn book and, and ought to be a regular part of our church worship. But one of the great hymns that we still sing today was written 250 years ago. I mentioned John Newton this morning who, who wrote um, Amazing Grace. He wrote hundreds of, of hymns. 
And、uh, one of the great hymns he wrote that we still sing today is、uh, "Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken, Zion, City of Our God."、Uh, that hymn would be familiar, I'm sure, to to many of us this evening. But maybe what you don't know, or maybe never realised, that those words that Newton used for that hymn, "Glorious Things of of Thee Are Spoken, Zion, City of Our God." Are taken directly from Psalm eighty-seven, and I just wonder, maybe speculation, but I, I just wonder whether John Newton、uh, was thinking of these words because he himself had also experienced the grace of God that the sons of Korah had experienced. So you know that we've taken、uh, a break during the summer from the Book of Numbers, but there is a connection. You remember that. Quite some time ago now that we were looking at Numbers chapter sixteen, and one of the leaders of among God's people of, of one of the tribes of God's people was Korah, and he rebelled against the leadership of Moses, and he incurred God's judgment. You remember that quite literally the ground opened up and swallowed him up, and、um, but it, but we're told later on in the book of Numbers twenty chapter twenty six. That the sons of Korah, the children of Korah, were spared,、um, and and in actual fact, they became, they were appointed as the worship leaders of God's people, so that they led the musicianship and the the、uh, chor. They were the choristers,、uh, they were the they were the choir、uh, for God's people in worship in the temple in Jerusalem, and that's why this they wrote. Somewhere around about maybe a dozen psalms that are given this superscription: the Psalm of the Sons of Korah, and Psalm eighty-seven is one of those. So, so there is a connection here a little bit with the Book of Numbers, and it reminds us that here are the sons of Korah who had been spared because of God's love and kindness and grace, and their natural response is to sing songs. Of praise, because they've experienced God's mercy and grace. So, when you've experienced the forgiveness and the love and the the grace of God, you 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 want to sing about it, don't you? You can't help. How can you not sing about such love? And maybe that's why John Newton was thinking about these words in this psalm when he wrote the hymn, "Glorious things of Thee are spoken." But notice the reason why these sons of Korah, in Psalm eighty-seven, the reason why they want to praise God, is because they count it an enormous privilege to be among and to belong to the people of God. This is a, a psalm that praises God simply for the sheer wonder and the privilege of being counted among God's people. So you know that at regular times in the year, that God's people would go up to Jerusalem,、um, and to appear in the temple to to worship at the various feasts during the year. There would be thousands, literally, of worshippers gathered together on what is now the Temple Mount, and they would be、uh, um, among them, being led by the sons of Korah, thinking to themselves, "What a privilege!" What a sheer privilege to be among the people of God and to be gathered together to worship Him. Well, I wonder if that is your own experience. Do you consider it to be a privilege to belong to the Church of Christ? Do you regard it as a privilege to be able to join with God's people and to worship and to praise Him, to sing His praises tonight? Um, I, I thought it would be good for us to do our hearts good to think about the privilege of belonging to the Church of Christ, to be belong to the people of God, as we see in this psalm. Well, what do we see in Psalm eighty-seven? Well, thankfully,、uh, it divides neatly into three sections. You'll notice that there's a little word, the Hebrew word "selah," at the end of verse three. And then also at the end of verse six, nobody fully know. Nobody can kind of dogmatically say what the word "selah" means, but it, it's a musical term. It probably means pause and think.
you know, read those words and then stop and just think about the words that you've just read. I think that's, that seems to be what the word selah um, means. But for our purposes, it, it divides the psalm up into three sections. We see in verses 1 to 3, verses 1 to 3, the glory of God's people. In verses 4 to 6, the identity of God's people. And then in verse 7, the rejoicing of God's people. And after each section, the Lord says, Selah, now pause, just stop and think, just ponder upon those things. So first of all, in verses 1 to 3, we, we're told about the glory of God's people. When he talks about Zion, he's not talking just about what became known as the city of David. Uh, some of you who've been to Israel, you know that um, on the south side of the Temple Mount of the, the old city, that there's a, uh, what originally was established by David as the city of David, and you, kind of, you can go down and follow the steps down to Hezekiah's tunnel, and some of you who've done that. But you see, the psalmist, he's not really thinking about the place. He's not thinking about the geography of the Temple Mount. He's, he's not so much talking about the physical location, but he's thinking about the people that gather there to worship. And, and what we have is a, a reminder, a hint perhaps, of paradise in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, when God dwelt with the first man and woman, Adam and Eve. In Genesis chapter 2, we're given a lovely description of the, the Garden of Eden before they disobeyed God and before sin ruined everything, came into the world and, and ruined everything. Remember that we have such a beautiful description of Eden. as a, We're told it was a well-watered garden, slightly elevated, it seems, because rivers flow down from, uh, from uh, paradise. And God met there with the first man and woman in the cool of the day. And the description that we have here is, it's reminiscent of that. It, 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 it points us to paradise. A description of Zion, of God's people, is similar. Glorious things are spoken of this place, which God loves more than anywhere else. And the point is, it's, it's the location of the temple. It's where God met with his people in the temple to worship him. And this place is so beautiful, not because of the geography, but because of his people who gather there to, to worship him as he meets with his people, those who know and love him. You know, we, I think we need to remind ourselves again and again of the privilege of belonging to God's people, the Church of Christ. Sometimes we, we can speak so, or think so lowly, really, of the Church sometimes, and let's be honest, sometimes we, we can speak disparagingly of, of the local Church. I'm not equating with the, lo the local Church, with the Church triumphant, with uh, the, the, we know that in this world that the local Church, that the a visible church will be will comprise of both wheat and tares, but but what a privilege it is to be numbered among the people of God. The reality is that God dwells among His people, so that His glory dwells among us. At various points in the Scriptures, you see reminder. You get reminders, or or you get pictures of that. For example, in in Second Chronicles chapter seven. You remember when Solomon had finished the construction of the temple and they turned to the Lord in prayer. Do you remember how uh, we're told, in fact, we're told in chapter 7 of 2 Chronicles that when Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. When all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord in, on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground, worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. And then Solomon turns to the Lord in prayer and the Lord speaks to him. 
And the, the Lord says, now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever. And my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. That's the image that we have of the gathered people of God, isn't it? Now, you could turn around and you could say, but, but come on, this is, that's, that's Old Testament stuff, isn't it? That's in the Old Testament. Well, before we run away with that idea, can I remind you about Acts chapter 2 and what happened on the day of Pentecost when really we have a kind of repetition of that. Um, when God's people are gathered, we're told that God dwelt amongst his people, a small gathered people in the early church. And, and remember that, that God came down in much the same way and tongues of fire appeared over his people, displaying the glory of God. And, and something remarkable happened in the community when they saw the glory of God in the midst of his people. Remember that we're told fear came upon all the people round and about, upon the community. People were fearful of, of the church. They were afraid to come to the church. And yet, at the same time, we're told that multitudes were being added to the church. So there's this paradox you know, the, the community, on, on, on the one hand, they're almost fearful because they know God is in the midst of these people. And yet, at the same time, there is this, there's something so irresistibly attractive about these people. Something so compelling that they long to join them and, and to have whatever it is that these people have that they don't have. That's... The church, isn't it? That's the New Testament church of Christ. You know, we need to remember that. It is a fact that these Christians were so radically different from the world. It's, it's the fact that they were so radically different from the world about that made them so compellingly attractive. The reality is that God is among us. God dwells among us as his people. And that's what draws the attention of the world when the world sees that God is among these people of a truth. Uh, incidentally, that is why it is so foolish to think that the way that you win the world is, becoming, is by becoming like the world. Why would, the, why, would the, why would unbelievers want to join the church if we're no different to the world around it's when the church reflects more and more the glory of God that the world starts to sit up and take notice and ask us for a reason for the hope that lies within us. So you see, that is the strange paradox of the church. When God dwells in the midst of his people, the world may ridicule us, the world may pity us, but the one thing that they cannot do is ignore us. As John Newton says in that hymn that I quoted earlier, let the world deride or pity, we will glory in God's name. So, verses 1 to 3, that's what the psalm is telling us, isn't it? The Lord loves the gates of Zion. Glorious things are spoken of this city. God's glory dwells in the midst of his people. So please, don't, let's not, underestimate the church of Christ. We see the glory of God's people here in verses 1 to 3. But secondly, in verses 4 to 6, we see, secondly, the identity of God's people. Verses 4 to 6. I will make mention of Rahab. You may have a footnote in your Bible, or it may even say in your Bible, Egypt. It's a reference to, to Egypt. I will make mention of Egypt and Babylon to those who know me. Behold, O Philistia and Tyre, modern-day Lebanon, with, with Ethiopia, Cush. Um, here the psalmist is, is no longer speaking, but it seems that there is now another voice, and it's the voice of God himself. And God identifies his people as those who know me, those who, who know God. Again, you know, that's what we read elsewhere in the scriptures. So Jeremiah chapter 9, the Lord says, Jeremiah 9 verse 23, 
Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, says the Lord. That I am the Lord, executing, uh, sorry, e- exercising uh, loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, says the Lord. The Lord delights in the fact that his people know him. In fact, the Lord Jesus said something very similar. You remember in his high priestly prayer, John chapter 17? The Lord Jesus turns to the Father and prays, This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So, you see, this is how God identifies his people as those who know him. This is the desire upon God's heart, that men and women and boys and girls should know him. And God's purpose actually is that people of every tribe and tongue and nation may know him to the ends of the earth. That's that's what's going on here, isn't it? God is identifying people from all the nations who know him. From among the people of Egypt, Rahab, The Egyptians, you know, the avowed enemies of Israel. But God will save from among the Egyptians a people for himself. The Lord Jesus today is building his church in Egypt. Gospel churches. Then Babylon, you know, about 50 miles today south of Baghdad in modern-day Iraq. And God, he promises that he will establish his church in that ancient place that was that throughout the centuries has been so bitterly opposed to the people of God and yet God will work in their hearts and people will be born there born again there literally and then behold says the Lord there will be people from among the Philistines great enemies of God's people who will come to know me and those from Tyre so in in Old Testament times in modern day Lebanon A day will come when many there will know me. And God will have a people for himself amongst the people of Ethiopia. It may say Cush in your your translation. Which in those days was actually a part of greater Sudan. But it represented, the point is it represented the ends of the earth. the, The ends, the farthest point of the known world. And God is saying that he promises that he will save a people from the farthest reaches of the world, of the known world. And so this is the identity of God's people from among all the nations of the earth. So different in many ways. And yet the one thing that unites us, wherever we are from, is that we know him, is that we know the Lord, and that we are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and God tells us here in his word that the reason we know him is because he's changed our hearts. We were spiritually blind. Our hearts were dead. Now, we heard that, didn't we, in the testimony this morning from Richard, from Ricky Knight this morning. And he quoted from Ezekiel 36. You know, God says, I will sprinkle clean water upon, their, upon them and uh, their hearts I will take out their hearts of stone and give them a heart of flesh, says God. He's talking about the new birth, regeneration. The only reason we know him is because he changed our hearts. Without that, we we would have no idea. We might read the Bible, but it would be a closed book to us. We would read about Jesus and his death upon the cross and why he came into the world, and it would mean... Absolutely nothing to us unless God changes our hearts. And yet God says that people from Egypt, Babylon, Philistia, Lebanon, Ethiopia will all and have come to to know him. And so there are people then from among the most bitterest enemies of God's people and yet they're now united with all of God's people and enjoy unity with God's people. And the only explanation is as God says, they were born there. They were born here. This one was born there. That one was born there too.
he's not talking about geographical location, but he's talking about spiritual birth. He's not talking about physical birth. And the reason why they know and why we know the Lord is because we've been born again into the family of God's people, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't this such a beautiful picture of the church? Such diversity, every tribe, tongue, and nation, and yet a unity that nobody else knows except the people of God. Nobody experiences the unity that we have as that degree of unity, as God's people, a unity through faith, through union with Christ, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I tell you, there is nothing quite like the Church of Christ. And the only way to become a part of of the church, you can attend the church, but do you really know him? Do you remember in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, again we are told very significantly that there were Jews gathered from all the nations, Cappadocia and Bithynia and, and, and uh, all of these various uh, nations that we are that are listed in Acts chapter two, and uh, they came and and the apostle Peter, he he's been given the keys of the kingdom, which means preaching the gospel, and he begins to use the keys of the kingdom by preaching the gospel of Christ and Him crucified, and on that day the Spirit of God comes down, three thousand are converted and added to the church and the only explanation is because God has worked in their hearts and they've been born again by the Holy Spirit and yet a thousand years before Pentecost here in Psalm 87 the sons of Korah are telling us you must be born again I wonder is that is that what Jesus was really saying to Nicodemus Do you remember John chapter 3 And the Lord Jesus, remember he's talking about being born again. And Nicodemus, who is not just a teacher, but he is the teacher in Israel. He is the leading teacher in in Israel. The leading rabbi in Israel. And remember that he he hasn't got a clue what Jesus is talking about. And Jesus looks at him and, and it's almost as though he says, it's almost as though he is saying, Nicodemus, are you really the teacher of Israel? And you've never read Psalm 87 about the new birth? So being brought into the family of God and being part of God's people, it only happens when we've been born again, when God works in our hearts, and when we are, what a privilege to belong to the family of God. And not only a privilege, but also what security we have too. See, verses 5 and 6, God registers their names. The Most High himself shall establish her. The Lord will record when he registers the peoples. This one was born there and that one was born there. So it is God who establishes us, who registers us, so that as a Christian tonight, you know, not just because of this passage, but elsewhere in the scriptures, you need to remember that, that God knows you by name. He has called you by name, and you are his. He says you are mine. He knows you by name. He records your name in the Lamb's book of life. Those whom he saves, he keeps and keeps forever. Jesus says, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish Neither shall anyone snatch them from my hand or from my Father's hand. So that when God breathes new life into a dead heart, God will complete the work that he has begun, the good work that he has begun. So that whatever happens to you in this world, what, whatever, whatever may be taken from you, you may, your health may be taken from you. Maybe, maybe family are taken from you. But you can rejoice in this, that that no one can take away your relationship with the Lord. So that whatever else happens, whether the spirits are subject to us or not, says Jesus, you can rejoice in this, that your names are written in heaven. You can rejoice in that unchanging reality 
that God registers your name in heaven. And he says, this one was born there too. So in verses 4 to 6, we see the identity of God's people. So we see the glory of God's people. We see the identity of God's people. And then thirdly, lastly, verse 7, we see the rejoicing of God's people. Both the singers and the players on instruments say, all my springs are in you. Here are God's people. And what a, a joyful response to what God has done in saving them. Actually, the uh, commentators uh, are not absolutely certain what the reference to the players on instruments means. Um, some have suggested it means dancing. Um, I'll leave that with you. Um, somebody once wrote a book, didn't they? They said, why do you dance in worship? And they said, well, we dance because we can't fly. Um, well, whatever else, I, I would say this, that it, it does mean, it certainly includes exuberant worship and joyful worship of, of God, as God's people. It, isn't that exactly what we'd expect when God has been so gracious, when God has forgiven us so much and been so merciful, the sons of Korah cannot help but praise God as they say, all my springs are in you, Lord. The springs that they're referring to are uh, springs of water. What does that mean? All my springs are in you. Do I think the best illustration of what that means took place every year in the temple in Jerusalem. The sons of Korah would have been familiar, no doubt, with that. But every year... In every year in the temple in Jerusalem, they would have celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles, which remembers even to this day, if you go to Israel in the autumn, at a certain point in the autumn, um, I've been there in September and seen these, I've wondered what these strange green booths were, um, and realized, of course, that they are the, um, the booths that God commanded his people to construct during the Feast of Tabernacles, to remind themselves of how God kept them. You remember? Through the wilderness. And he, he fed them, but he also gave them water from the rock. And so on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, then there would be this tremendous ceremony when, and, and you can read about it, 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 at least the Lord Jesus refers to that in, in John chapter 7, um, they would go down from the mountain, the, the Temple Mount, they would go down the pathway, which has recently, last few years, been reopened. You can go down the pathway to the pools of Siloam, and, and what they would do, they would take these huge, I mean, absolutely enormous containers, fill them, loads of them, with water, carry them up to the Temple Mount, and uh, on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, there would be this ceremony for the outpouring of water, and it would be just copious amounts, floods of water that would be poured out upon the Temple Mount in the temple. And it was on the last day, we're told in John chapter 7, at the last, on the last day of the great, the last great day of the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus stands up just as they poured out copious amounts of water, and Jesus lifts up his voice and he says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. It was a celebration. It was, it was a time of rejoicing. As they, would, as they poured out the water, God's people would be reciting the words of Isaiah chapter 12. You shall, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And it was at that moment that Jesus cries out, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And what Jesus is saying is that he is the fulfillment of all of that. Jesus says, come to me, I am the smitten rock. I am the one out of whose belly actually flow rivers of living water. Jesus is saying that he is the fulfillment of all that that symbolized. He is the one who fulfills Psalm 46, 
There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God. And it means, you see, that Jesus is the only one who can satisfy our thirsty souls. He is the one to whom these words of Psalm 87 were pointing. All my springs are in you. The sons of Korah, having experienced the grace and mercy of God, are rejoicing. And although they may not have realized it, they were actually, they were actually being pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ, saying, all my springs are in you, Lord Jesus. Well, I wonder, can you say that this evening? Have you found that nothing else and that no one else can satisfy the longings of your soul. But Jesus, none but Jesus. All our springs are found in Christ and flow from the heart of Christ. In fact, there was that day, wasn't there, when the Lord Jesus was taken and crucified and a soldier thrust a spear into the side of Jesus and outflowed water and blood. It's because of the crucifixion of Jesus on account of his finished work that the Holy Spirit 40 days later was given. Pentecost is because of Calvary. And what a privilege as those who know him to come then this evening to the Lord's Supper and to remember how he was pierced for us so that we might know life in all of its abundance all because Jesus was smitten and afflicted for us. And all because, all because all of our springs are, are in him, are found in Jesus.